Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and with me, Dimitri Leyland. Hey, how's Dimitri, it going? Dimitri, how are you? I'm back again. You on are? show, that means... Because? We have a release. Sweet. Woo! Visual Studio 2013 Update 4. Yes. And other things to talk about as well. Oh, yeah. There's a lot a going on today. It's a very busy day. If you're, if you're watching this on November 12th, you're like, wow, that's a lot of stuff. I know, my head's spinning. So, what's happening? Yeah, let's jump into it. So we've got a couple of things we're going to cover today. Uh, let's first of all talk about the news of the day. I mm -hmm. think it's important for folks to know what else they can take a look on. Of course, this is an update for video, so we'll focus on that for the majority. But I figured it'd be good to start off with the news of the day. And of course, we'll have a bunch of demos. So uh, yep. you know, we've got two people coming in. We've got Aaron Bjork coming on. Rong is coming back. She was here the last time. She's coming back to show us more C++ coolness. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. we'll have a bunch of cool demos. Should be a fun day. But let's jump right in. So. Uh, we started off quite recently, in fact, and uh, we did a whole video on Update 3, right? In fact, we did two videos did on two Update 3. And during that time, we, we talked about just how much has happened before Update 3 landed, bef you know, between Update 2 and Update 3. We were in the same kind of situation. So I figured it'd be good to highlight some of the great releases we had since we released Update 3 and before we got to today. That Update 3 RC video, 600 plus thousand views. Yeah, it's awesome. People are interested. Yeah. You know, we, we have a lot of developers. We'll see if we can forget. top that with this one. Yeah, we'll try our best. Because <laughs> there's more competition of other things going on this time around. So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, this day is going to be a little bit busy, but we'll do our yeah. best. <laughs> so we, we've had quite a few things happen. Um, released Update 3, but then uh, in August, that same month, we we had two more releases. We started to uh, ship an update to uh, Visual Studio 14, and also we that was CTP3. Mm -hmm. And then we also shipped the Python tools update. Right. Folks um, often forget that we actually build uh, high quality tools for Visual Studio for working on Python. Yeah, we did building, a show on that. Yeah, you guys did a show, scientific, websites, Azure integration, some really great yeah, stuff for cool folks. 2.1 RC landed right there in, in August. Uh, as soon as we were done recording, and then when we got to September, um, we got into the first CTP of Update 4. So in September, this update that went RTM today was already in its first CTP, mm -hmm. then it was in the second CTP. That same month, uh, we released an update to Visual Studio Tools for Unity. So folks interested in game development uh, probably have heard we acquired these, this extension made yep. by a third party earlier. So now we're revving it all the time. So a new version landed. It's free for, for customers of Visual Studio. Uh, we also had Team Explorer everywhere. Another thing that folks once, once in a while forget that we have this Eclipse plugin that makes it easy to work with Visual Studio Online or Team Foundation Server. So that's a great way for uh, Java developers or folks working with Java uh, to integrate with TFS, something right. they, they might want to do. So we had all those releases. And then we got to October, and October was once again a busy month. We finally went RTM with Python Tools 2.1. I know how hard that team's been working. They, there's a great core team of folks that works on it. Uh, they have quite, quite some interesting things in the future, but for now, 2.1 RTM with lots of great new features mm -hmm. is out. Hope folks check it out. And we had the, yet another CTP of Visual Studio, as we called it, 14, and Unity again rev. So you can right. see every month we're, we're revving. I mean, this isn't the complete list, right? This is just like highlights uh, for the most part. And then we are today. So we are on November 12th, and today is, is a huge day for, for Microsoft developers because we, of course, first of all, foremost for this video, shipped update for RTM. That's yep. great and all. But we're also shipping a new SKU of Visual Studio for the first time, Visual Studio Community Edition. And that's something I'm super excited about. Uh, we're going to have a whole toolbox show just dedicated to that, as you know. And, uh, but to give the summary of what is Community Edition, it's a free version of Visual Studio. It's free for quite a few different kinds of users, whether you're, you're a startup, mm -hmm. whether you're, um, let's say, a, a small company even. Uh, there's certain EULA restrictions, but you, you, know, you can find the details uh, in the EULA for that. Uh, if you're an open source developer, no matter where you work or what you do, so lots of different kind of users are enabled with one SKU of Visual Studio. You will no right. longer have to chase different express queues. There's not going to be, uh, from this perspective, different kind of express queues. If you qualify for Community Edition, you get Community, Visual Studio Community, and you're good to go. It's a really powerful thing, and we're, we're not going to do it justice today. So I suggest folks check and out that episode. Two amazingly cool things about it: one, free; two, extensions work. Extensions work. Yes. yes. So Unity that we talked about, Python development, uh, things from our open source community, Web Essentials. You know, lots of stuff that we've yep. actually enabled for different Express Productivity keys power there. tools. Productivity power tools. <laughs> Some things that we've shown on this show. Yeah, SQLite toolbox. 
all kinds of stuff. Yeah, the whole extensibility, you know, website that we have with all the free extensions and third party mm -hmm. extensions, if, as long as you can get access to the extension, if it's free yes. or you buy it from a third party, you can use it with community. Right. Huge, huge difference than Express. I, I think, I think this or is Or even huge. if your extension costs money. Yeah. It's not limited to free extensions. Oh, yeah. And as long as you can get access to right. it. That's why I said okay. it that way. You know, if you can get access to it, you can use the extension. Yes. We're not doing community justice here, but it's it's stream. It's a we should do an entire show on that, and we will. Okay, I think we will. Um, uh, but one thing to say is that the first version we're shipping of Community today includes Update Four automatically. Mm -hmm. So there's okay. no such thing as Community Update Three or earlier. You're going to have everything. We're going to show you all the cool features today. You can get it right with Community. Okay, well. cool. But that's not all. Uh, today we're also shipping a new version of the Azure SDK. So mm -hmm. uh, those folks working with, with our cloud with Azure know that Azure SDK is core to give them more capabilities inside of Visual Studio. Visual Studio comes with some Azure tooling, but with the SDK 2.5 you get even more. They've enhanced uh, more scenarios with cloud diagnostics. They finally added for the first time HD Insights tooling for, for the scripting that you do for big data. That's huge. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the um, uh, kind of DevOps features that we shipped as preview before as other outer band releases are now rolled in. It's, a, it's, it's worth doing its own kind of focus on it. We're not going to spend any time on that today in this Cloud episode. Cloud Cover will have a show on it. Yeah, but Cloud Cover and other things, it. yeah. I'm sure there'll be plenty of great places. And as part of you know our events today, you, you can find I think this time around, it's, it's, they've done a lot of stuff in the SDK. They haven't done that much in the actual tooling, so we'll let yeah. Cloud Cover cover. We'll yeah. let Cloud Cover cover. Cloud, cloud, cloud Cover cover. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Um, but yeah, it's certainly, you know, if you're, if you're a cloud developer, you should always have it installed. I'm sure right. you do. So it's it's not even a question. And the cool thing is that this SDK 2.5 actually works with yet another big announcement we made today, which is Visual Studio 2015 Preview. Nice. Can so we it has clap a name. for that one? It has, it has a, a name. real name. You guys don't know what not it takes 14, to, to make a name happen. Not Visual Studio 2014, not yeah. Visual Studio 14. Yeah. It has a name. It has a name. So Visual Studio 14 or as we internally have called it, Dev14 right. now has a name. So Visual Studio 2015 uh, preview is, is released today, and Azure SDK 2.5 works with either the RTM version 2013 or 2012, in fact, mm -hmm. or uh, 2015 preview. Right. Uh, we also announced the big two things in the .NET sphere, which is .NET 2015 and ASP.NET 5, including all the cloud-optimized technologies. We've been talking about Project right. K, as it was known. Um, that's its own monster, right? We'll never, we'll never be able to cover it in a toolbox <laughs> episode like today. Uh, but yeah, it's a busy day. Yeah, I'm tired just by, by telling <laughs> you all this. That's, that's a lot. So let's for this show, we'll keep our focus on 2013 update four. Yeah. Um, and obviously, we we encourage folks to go learn about all the other things. There's tons of good coverage on Channel Nine um, on these other things. Let's talk about update four. Yeah. So let's jump into update four. First thing um, is I want to go through kind of a rough overview of the highlights of the features, and uh, you know we'll let our guests and some of the other details later okay. on the show kind of reveal themselves. Uh, but let's talk about from a higher level. What are the, some of the top things I'm excited about in Update 4? Uh, these include uh, various elements for web developers and Azure developers. So in, right in Update 4, uh, this means that you don't need Azure SDK for these features, right? These mm -hmm. are features that actually ship in Update 4. Right. So if you install it, you get improvements to the JSON editor, our JSON editor is useful not just for web development. It's not designed just for web development, but it's huge for web developers. And we keep revving it with every release. So there's a bunch of new features in there, and I'll show you some of the details. Uh, yeah, we'll you don't have to be a web developer to do JSON. If you're course, doing yeah. uh, Azure Service Bus, the configuration is a JSON file. A lot of configurations so, today are yeah. JSON. So, I mean, that's just one example. So to have a a good editor inside Visual Studio and have improvements to that editor. Configuration scenarios, useful. DevOps scenarios, web scenarios, yep. everything is pretty much moving to JSON. It's a great format. I mean, that's that's really why. So our editor there is improving. We're also making, as always, improvements to HTML, CSS editing, so lots of features there. Some things smaller, some things bigger, but you know they all add up to, mm -hmm. to a better experience. And we've, we've updated our web jobs tooling to finally be uh, included kind of fully in the box with Visual Studio. So web jobs, uh, it's something we've talked about before. You've had, you've had a guest last time. Yeah, we had time. Brady Gaster was here last time to show it. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so, so I would say that with this, re this release, the SDK is in the box. It's been updated. Mm -hmm. The tooling's been up updated so that right from the Server Explorer, you can start and stop your job. So it's really right. cool that you have those capabilities. Um, and of course, we, we keep shipping updates to the framework. So ASP.NET MVC, Web API, you, know, you name it, all those things are yeah, revving their NuGet right. packages. And when, when there's a good stable version, we update the templates. So when you do file a new project, 
-hmm. it's updated for you. So there's a list of those that have been updated as well. Okay. In the C++ space, we've got two things uh, we've, that are kind of highlights for me. The big one is the GPU usage as part of the performance of the Agnostic Hub. So GPU usage is a great way to tell, hey, is, is my app kind of my C++ or DirectX or, or even, even WPF, I mean, anything that's really using DirectX, is my DirectX GPU heavy app uh, performing and having performance issues because of the GPU mm -hmm. or because of scenarios related to the CPU or something else, right? So this tool lets you visualize that and we'll have a guest on today. So yeah, Rong's going to gonna come yeah. on and show that very yeah. shortly. So Rong's going to show us it's going to be cool. And also when you have really large solutions in C++, uh, so when you open up an existing solutions, we've, we've had some complaints from customers saying when we have a very large one, it takes a long time to load, um, yeah. the UI is getting sticky, go to definition isn't working, kind of right away and people are not even sure always why why that's happening. So we've we spent some time optimizing. So hopefully that's always goodness. Yeah. Anytime solutions open faster, that's just good. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing you want is like <laughs> open and have Visual Studio say you're not responding, right? That's, right. We remember those days very well. Yep. We've, we've done a lot to try to make it better. It's not perfect. All, all feedback is always welcomed. And then in the Team Foundation server side, when you install update four on both sides of the fence, um, in, mm -hmm. in Team Foundation Server 2013, there's a bunch of new capabilities. So these include uh, charting uh, changes, both for work item tracking and test case management. There's new, these web-based charts in, in the web UI. Um, Git pull requests is on-premises now, which mm -hmm. is great. We've got updates to App Insights tooling, release management tooling. Uh, test case management has a bunch of new features. Uh, we'll have another guest, as you know, for that. Yep. Coming up right after this, in fact, uh, to talk about it. So it'll be our first guest of the show today. Yep. Uh, so he'll show that. So lots, lots of great changes. I mean, free update, right? Lots of great features. Yeah, there you go. I think it's, it's worth installing. Microsoft supports our update, so I think it's worth doing. Um, I want to switch over right now to some things I wanted to show before we went on to, to our demos. Uh, so the first thing that I want to bring up here is a blog post um, that we'll have a link in the show notes for. This mm -hmm. is the, the .NET team. When the RC release of Update 4 came out just recently, they actually did a really good job to document all the new features. So okay. because these features are really small, I didn't think spending time demoing it right now would be the best use of our time. Uh, so I just wanted to run through this blog post for two seconds and show you some of the highlights for me. So here they, they talk about the JSON editor, uh, there's improvements to schema validation, minifying, you know, lots of little features that, it, you know, if you, if you like this tool and you use it, I think you're going to appreciate even more changes to it. And then when we get to the HTML editor, I found actually a couple of these features are really cool. So I wanted to, to show and highlight them. Uh, for example, my favorite one, and of course folks can, can look at the complete list, but I, I really love the fact that region mm. support got added. I think that's really cool. You can yeah. see here how uh, you can actually have a collapsible region. You can use, use the, these tags right here to define the region, and then you collapse and expand it. This works in, in HTML and CSS files, which that's is nice. really, really great. Yeah. So I think uh, web developers will appreciate it. How many times have you wanted one of these as a web developer? I'll raise my hand. That was me. I, I was like, my gosh, that's awesome. Um, they also added the ability to do uh, different kind of tags in here. So you can do like to do and hack and other mm. uh, what they call common tokens and they'll show up in your task list. Nice. This is supported in managed code files, for example, yeah, but wasn't there supported there. for a long there. time, now yeah. in HTML. Cool. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. Uh, we also have improvements to our uh, CSS less CSS editors. Um, so lots of changes there, but one of the ones is the same kind of support for these, these hack and notes and regions and such. Uh, they also added, I, I think this is really cool, a lot more snippets. Cool. So the snippet support, um, you know, can often save you a lot of time. But what I typically found in Visual Studio is there wasn't a lot of in-the-box snippets. And, right. I, and I've created my own, sure, you know, for real things. But it's great to see a lot more snippets get in, added in there. And we're always looking for kind of feedback on what folks might be interested mm -hmm. in. So they take a look at those. That's pretty cool. And we have a new feature in Browser Link, our ability to connect to a browser to do kind of debugging. So, um, you know, saving the CS file, changing it externally, uh, you know, can cause the reloads. And they've, they've done some stuff to optimize it by enabling the auto sync with it. And finally, uh, web jobs tooling. Web jobs tooling is, again, something we've been revving for a while. Yep. We, we had a guest on before, but here's an example where uh, you, we've really taken to the next step. You know, for me, when something gets integrated with like the server explorer experience, when you can yeah. do things like uh, start and stop it, run it on demand, or schedule it right from Visual Studio, it becomes so much the more easier. The less you have to go out to the portal to do things like this, the better. Yeah. Right? I mean, I love the portal. You know, and it's not a diss on the portal or the guys who work in the portal, 
but they're outside. They're angry. They've got they got picket <laughs> signs now. I like being able to do things inside Visual Studio. Less context switching is always a good thing. Robert Green said the portal sucks. Robert, I <laughs> don't be uh, picketing outside the office. I here. said I love the portal, but <laughs> I like doing things in Visual Studio. <laughs> yes, uh, Visual Studio definitely is is a huge advantage. Don't say there. bad things about the portal. Yeah, there you go. So lots more information, folks. You check it out. All the package update stuff is in here. So all all the details are in this post. But I also want to show one one last thing which is the fact that uh, we have great release notes now in visualstudio.com for every single the release. The guy in marketing who's been responsible for getting these things up deserves some kudos. That's whoever what that I Whoever that is, Wh whoever that, whoever that is person is. my hero. I, I, you, I if you probably see know him personally. If you probably see him, him tell him that. I will try my best. Okay. I'll, I'll see him today probably at some point, so I'll okay. let him know. Uh, great guy. So, <laughs> So, so this, they um, so they say. So these release notes are our attempt to to make it easy to follow what we're releasing. Mm -hmm. Like we, we're shipping very fast, right? So this is the comprehensive view of everything in RTM. All the things that we talked about, things we're going to demo, uh, information about community edition, information about past releases. Uh, we're doing these right now for RC or RTM releases, and we're looking to to move into the CTP phase of of the releases as well. Yep. Just a matter of you know ramping our teams up to be able to keep up. I mean these are these are we're trying to make them high quality. We've included uh, these kind of two box episodes mm -hmm. here. We're cool. doing our best. Again, we love feedback from the community. Folks want to email me, let me know, Twitter me, whatever. What do you think about how we're communicating with you? That'd be really it, awesome. It's a great it's a great place to to find things that may have been in an update you didn't know about, right? So you are now on update four. You know I've installed three, two, one. There. Are or things in there that showed up in these various updates that I didn't necessarily know were in there. Yeah, right. Yeah. This lets so you find them all. This is a great place. way to go to go find these things. Yeah, and whenever we do a release, we, we say what's the related releases, things we might have shipped recently. Yep. You know, for example, Connect for Windows SDK 2.0 shipped as RTM as well. Right. If you missed it, you're looking for an update four. You're like, oh, that that also got released. So, yeah. so I think that's pretty cool. Cool. Well, that's all I wanted to show, and uh, I guess it's time we jump into yeah, some time guests. Yeah, to get to demos. Yeah, let's all do right. it. Let's do that. Let's do it. So our first guest is Aaron Bjork. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Robert. Making your debut appearance on my show. You're glad That's to awesome. be here. Yeah, this is fun. Aaron is a principal group program manager in the Visual Studio services team. Cloud services. Cloud services team, you got excuse it. me. Um, which means VSO and Team Foundation server. That's right, yeah. Okay. So I look after the, the work item tracking, uh, agile project management, and reporting investments mm -hmm. that we make. Um, across Visual Studio Online and Team Foundation Server. Awesome. And you're going to show us some new features in Team Foundation Server. Yes. Uh, specifically, I want to show you just a few things that we've done, uh, specifically that are coming in Team Foundation Server 2013 Update 4. Okay. You ready? Ready. All right. Let's take a look. So I'm going to actually start by um, showing you our product backlog, which looks the same as it does before. But one thing that you might notice that's different is that we've added a configuration that allows uh, teams within a team project to actually choose whether or not they want bugs to show up on their backlog. So this was something that prior was only available through process template configuration and really out of the box only configured on our Scrum process template. But we've now made a change where um, I can come up to my team project settings and I can do this per team and I can select whether or not bugs are on my backlog. So you can see I've just turned bugs off, and I'm going to come back over here and refresh, and we'll see that my bugs disappear from the backlog. And I'm going to just simply go switch it back on, switch over, and F5 again. So when do people typically decide whether to show them or not? What's you the know, thinking that goes into it's it? It's really a preference. We find that most uh, Scrum teams or teams that are practicing a Scrum methodology like to see the bugs right there on their product backlog. They're treating them just like any other backlog item, and they're stuff prioritizing them. Stuff that needs them. to be done. It's work. It, it's all Whether stuff it's that needs to be done. A feature that hasn't been written or it's a bug, you can't ship until it's fixed. That's right. And you can take it and prioritize it, assign it to sprints, just like you would any other item from mm -hmm. your backlog. But if you come from a more traditional world, you might have uh, a backlog, which is only made up of requirements okay. for your project. And then you might have bugs in a separate query, and okay. you don't want them uh, showing up on your backlog. So. The reason I'm so excited about this feature is that it's not just a project level feature, but it's actually configurable per team. So uh, teams get to decide mm -hmm. within the team project, and, okay. uh, and we like that. Sweet. So, yeah. So that's uh, just one feature. Uh, let me show you another one, which is in a, in a category of a bunch of uh, what we call small rocks or little things that we did to improve uh, work item usability. And this one si might seem really trivial, but You've often got a lot of information in a work item. And you can see here that uh, in my system, system info tab, there's quite a bit of data mm -hmm. trapped in this little 
uh, tab. But scrolling like this is just, you know, it's not going to work. Um, we've added a bunch of little features, and this is one of them, which is just a full screen feature, nice. which takes that particular uh, rich text field or HTML field and just blows it up. And, uh, you know, it, it takes the entire screen. And while that works uh, really well in this dialog view from the backlog, if you are, um, if you have a direct link to the work item query, you know, you can full screen the query and then you can come in here and uh, full screen these views as well to make sure that you get maximum real estate. So that's just a nice okay. uh, usability. And mm -hmm. we've also done a bunch of performance uh, improvements around opening work items. If you're using small projects with just a few work items, you might not really notice. But if you're okay. in one of those larger environments, uh, we're doing a bunch of progressive rendering and just making sure that the work items are really snappy. Uh, usability and, and fast is good. Yep, you know, so we want to make sure we prioritize that. So that's another nice cool. little feature that mm -hmm. we've done. Um, another one, and I'm going to switch over to the test hub. It also makes it a little bit more touch friendly too it, because you don't have to try and scroll with absolutely, the finger. Absolutely. Anytime you're working in those little tiny boxes, yes. you're going to get frustrated. So I've moved over to the, the test hub and we have brought a couple of uh, key improvements to the test hub. The first is all of our test artifacts are now work items. So whether you're working with a test plan or a test suite, they're all work items. And because they're work items, they get benefits of things like work item tags. So I can um, assign tags to this particular test case. They'll show up right here in the hub and I can come up here and filter by them as well. So mm. this isn't a particular interesting filter because I've only got one tag and a few items. But it just makes uh, for some nice usability improvements in right. terms of working with your test cases and test plans. The other one, which I'm really excited about, is that we've added um, some new preview views here where you can uh, choose what you want on the right-hand side here. You can see things like uh, the test case. You can actually see, see related test suites or even test results uh, and recent test results for any of these test cases. So when you're working with a lot of this test data, mm -hmm. uh, this allows you to sort of bring it together into some nice views. And then finally, we've enabled you to create charts off of all this data as well. Nice. And this one is super fun. You uh, switch over to the charts view on your uh, test hub, and you can come up here and just create a new chart. So I'm gonna create a new test result chart here. Uh, I'll pick maybe failure type as my option, and we'll view it as a bar chart. And then I can come up here and, uh, and customize these colors, uh, change them to make sure that they, they meet the needs of my project. And then once I've created those charts, I can uh, actually take them and pin them directly to my home page. Nice. So I'm gonna pin this here. Notice I did that. I'm gonna go back to my home page, and there's that new chart that I've pinned, and I can drag and drop it and move it around. Cool. So that creates some really awesome visibility for uh, all those test artifacts and making sure you can keep track of them, uh, monitor them, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and watch them in a way that's not just a grid of data, but actually is visual. So, yeah, those are just a couple of small changes, but all coming in uh, Team Foundation Server 2013 Update 4. Excellent. Cool stuff. Thanks. Yep. For our second demo, I've asked Rong Lu to come on the show. Hi, Rong. Hi. Welcome Hi, back. Rong. Thank you for having me back. Hi, you I'm here, Rong. You were here for the Update 3 episode, yeah. and you showed us some great graphics diagnostics tooling that we added to Visual Studio for Update 3. Yeah. And now in Update 4, there's more yeah, goodness for C++. Yeah, we are adding more features. Cool. Um, one of the things we added is a GPU usage tool. Okay. It is a completely new tool to Visual Studio. So we added that to the Performance and Diagnostics Hub where you can launch the GPU tool and be able to analyze the performance of your DirectX applications. So, so how does that compare to the, to the diagnostics tools you showed us last time? So it kind of um, gives us a sense. Right. The, sh the tool we showed last time was called uh, Graphics Diagnostics, mm -hmm. which is focusing on fixing rendering issues okay. of your application. Um, this tool is more on the performance side. Got so it. let's say okay. your app is running all fine, but it's not running as fast as you had hoped for. So uh, a lot of the graphics apps or games, they have a target frame rate. Mm -hmm. uh, most cases, 60 on the PC. Um, on smaller devices, it could be 30. Okay. Um, but uh, sometimes in your development, you, you find that your app is not running at the frame rate you want. So you definitely want to tune the performance up. And this tool is going to help you uh, look into what's happening on the CPU versus GPU, what events will be executed. Mm -hmm and uh, identify opportunities to optimize. Cool, that sounds good. Um, so yeah, this is uh, here on the screen is a blog post. Uh, when this tool for, well, first shipped in update for CTP1, that was mm -hmm. the very first version we had rolled out. Now we are up to uh, 
the RTM version, so we have been putting a bunch of bug fixes into this and small features as well. Um, but this blog does have a brief introduction of this tool, okay. um, so step by step, so it has more information about what uh, graphics card we support. Um, okay. So one caveat to, to uh, this tool is because we grab um, performance data from the driver, that means you will need uh, to install the latest graphics driver from your card vendors, okay. whether you use Intel, NVIDIA, AMD cards, um, just go to their website and download the latest driver. Um, this In this blog post, we have a document that describes what kind of cards are supported and where you can download the drivers. Okay. So definitely more information in this blog post. Cool. Um, but today, we're going to show a quick demo of this tool. Excellent. So you can see that in action. Um, here I have Visual Studio open. Um, this is a DirectX application. I already know beforehand that this is not hitting the 60 frame rate, uh, 60 frames per second uh, target I okay. want. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch this app with the GPU usage tool. So we can see how the performance um, is, is going out on the CPU and GPU. I'm going to go to debug menu and open the performance and diagnostics hub. This is where you can find a bunch of diagnostics tools. Um, here's a new one we are adding uh, called GPU usage. You can actually just run this tool by itself or you can run it along with other tools. Mm. In this case, okay. we are actually going to run it along with the CPU usage tool so we can look into both sides of the performance. So I'm going to hit start. Now this app is going to run. So this is a uh, 3D app that simulates the city. Um, there are 60 by 60 buildings and um, 6,000 raindrops in each frame. Ah. Now, if you look at the frame rate here, it's uh, hovering around 52, 53 frames per it's second, um, but not, not quite. not bad, but it's not quite. Yeah, not what quite we want. at 60. Yeah. So let's go back to View Studio and see what this is doing. Um, so here, in the dive session, we have a number of live graphs um, showing you the real-time performance of your app. Mm -hmm. So we have frame time, frame rate, as well as GPU and CPU utilization data. Now let's stop the collection and I'm going to show you how to read the report. Okay. Now we have the report back. This studio has analyzed all the data it has uh, collected. And um, these are the same graphs that we have seen a lot in life. Um, frame rate here, um, my app was running at around 52 frames per second. Mm -hmm. um, this red line is showing the threshold, which is my target, 60. Uh, our app is not quite there yet. So let's scroll down to the GPU utilization and CPU utilization. This is showing how busy my GPU was when the app is running. Um, my GPU is pretty busy. Around 80% of, uh, of the resources are being used. But on the CPU side, the CPU is not as busy. Um, for the most of the time, it was only used 20%, uh, less than that, 12%, 14% mm -hmm. of the CPU resources are being used. Um, in some of the cases, when you look at performance issues, you might be able to tell if your app is GPU bound or CPU bound right from here by looking right. at this graph. Um, but in other cases, like this one, it's not so obvious because my, neither my CPU or GPU is fully being utilized. Um, and uh, we don't know, really know what happened. So let's take a look at the, uh, drill into the details. I can select a range on the timeline. Since this is uh, pretty flat um, in terms of uh, performance, I can select any uh, range in here mm -hmm. and click view details. Now here we're looking at a detailed report of my GPU usage. Let's take a look at the table down here first. Basically, what we have collected is every single DirectX event that happened on my GPU. So we collect all these data from the graphics driver. Mm -hmm. That's why the driver is needed. Um, and then we have the event name along with the CPU and GPU start time, how long it took on the GPU to execute, and which thread, which core, which GPU engine that occurred on. Up here, is a visual representation of the same data down mm -hmm. there. Um, so we have break, breaking the data into multiple lanes. 
we have uh, CPU cores, we have GPU engines, and all the color blocks are basically representing these events, the ex execution time of these events on the different cores or engines. Um, so we use different colors to represent different processes. In this case, my, the app I'm running is uh, in green. Um, but if there are other processes on your system that's taking GPU resources, we also record that mm -hmm. and use a different color to represent uh, time. So this graph is fully interactive. You can click anywhere on the graph. Um, that will also auto-select the, the corresponding event in the event list. This is basically saying um, this particular draw event, mm -hmm. this is when the, a the, CP the API call happened on the CPU. So CPU had an API call um, here first to prepare data. And then GPU start executing this draw call. And this is when it started. This is how long it took. Okay. So from here, you'll be able to see, hey, uh, which event is taking longer? And these are the, pr the expensive ones are probably the ones we should be looking into in your code. Um, so you can, you can navigate through this uh, graph just to get an idea of which one's taking longer and when, it, when the corresponding CPU event happened. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to mention on this graph are these vertical lines. These are vertical lines that represent uh, V-syncs of your display. This is basically saying um, our monitor is usually set to refresh 60 times uh, a second. Right. Um, that's, that's why your uh, app can run up to 60 uh, frames per second. You have a chance to, re to refresh your screen every 16 milliseconds. This is basically what the, the lines are stand, uh, stands for. Between two lines, it's standing for 16 milliseconds. Okay. So you have to basically for the app to, to hit 60 frames per second, uh, the CPU and the GPU have to complete all the work from preparing the data all the way to presenting within 16 milliseconds. That's how you can hit the 60 target. Um, Okay, now let's take a look at how this app uh, performed here. So all these P's, these, this small uh, character here, mm -hmm. these represent the present call, which is um, essentially when the, the content actually being refreshed on your screen, the, the user can see. Um, so this is the end. Basically, you do that at the end of each frame. Okay. So this will be the end of previous frame, and this will be the end of the current frame. So what that tells us is between the two Ps, this is how long it took for this single frame to render, uh, which, as we, as we can see, exceeds um, the 16 milliseconds right. budget we have. This is on the CPU. And we can tell that uh, on the GPU side, the GPU actually has time to break between each frame. Okay. So what we can tell from this graph is this app is CPU bound oh, rather than GPU bound. Interesting. Because CPU is so busy preparing the data uh -huh. itself took longer than 16 milliseconds. However fast GPU can run, we won't be able to do both within that budget. That's how cool. That's how we can tell wh where the problem is. So now we know this is a CPU bound problem. Uh, we can either just by clicking through these events mm -hmm. and trying to figure out which is taking longer and then go back to the code. Or we can actually take advantage of the CPU usage tool because we run both at the same time. Now we can come back and say, hey, give, tell me which function is using most of my CPU resources mm -hmm. uh, in this app. So now we are collecting and analyzing the CPU data so here's a list of all the functions. I'm just going to keep drilling into the tree until I find um, the event, the, the function that takes most of my CPU time. So apparently it's going to be in here. So it's 97%. I'll keep drilling in here. Oh, see? It's the render function. And here, it's when it's rendering rings. Oh. It took 70% of my CPU time just to prepare data for the ring. 
Now what I'm going to do... Which is interesting because I, I thought on the, when we looked at the GPU usage, it seemed to imply that the that there was nothing wrong with the rain and it was the city that was the problem GPU-wise, but it turns no, out yeah. in the app that it's actually the rain, not the city. Right. Very cool. Yeah. So <laughs> now we're going to uh, navigate back to the source code by clicking on view source, um, which took us back here. This is the commit updates function that's taking 70% of the time. Uh, if we look at the code, essentially what the key part of this function is this for loop. This for loop is preparing data for each ring job. And I mentioned earlier, we render 6,000 ring jobs in a, in a single frame. That is why this for loop has to, to iterate 6,000 times, um, which could take a long time on the CPU. This right. is basically preparing uh, append e the data for each ring job to a list. So that's why it's iterating. OK, now we know where the problem is. Let's go back to the GPU um, usage uh, report. The other thing we can actually tell from this report is, although a CPU is really, really busy, only one of the CPU cores is being used. Mm -hmm. I have eight cores on my machine, but only one is being used. So the idea here, um, how we fix this, is, hey, how about we paralyze this task? So all the ring jobs data can be prepared across different cores, mm. which could be uh, a way to improve your performance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace <coughs> the for loop with a parallel for. So parallel for essentially does the same thing that loop, loop through the, the, the list and prepare data. But the good thing is it's going to automatically dispatch the task onto multiple CPU cores mm -hmm. without you having to do anything. This is a function that's available in Visual Studio Parallel uh, library that's, that's uh, already there for you to use. Now let's go back and uh, run this app again and uh, if, see if this has fixed the problem. All right, All right, there we go. Much better. Now we are up to uh, 60 frames per second. Um, problem solved. Very Mission cool. Accomplished. Very cool. Um, of course, this is just one way to optimize the app. Mm -hmm. There are many ways. But the point is, you can use this tool um, to get some insights into what actually happened on yeah, CPU and GPU. That, that gives you, oh, I love that. It gives you uh, the, ability, the ability to to drill down and see exactly where the yeah, problem is. That's tremendous. Down to every single yeah. event. Yeah, that's very, a lot very of data cool. for you to analyze and uh, look at. Excellent. That is awesome stuff. Yeah, Thanks cool. for showing us that. Thank you for having me here. Hopefully you will like it and let us know if, uh, if you have any feedback. Absolutely. Thank you. Cool. So that's our look at update four. A lot of cool stuff. Yeah, a lot of cool stuff. Great demos. I'm yep. glad that Rong and Aaron were able to come in and, and do those demos yeah. for us. So I highly recommend you get it. It will appear in your Visual Studio on that little flag up in the upper right that turns black. Um, go to that, download Update 4. Also take a look at the other things that are shipping today. Visual Studio 2015 Preview, Community 2013. As always, let us know what you think. Let us know what kind of things you want on this show. Great to have you. Thank you very much. Do you want to say anything me. before I do all the talking? Uh, I think that's <laughs> it. I hope folks check out visualstudio.com slash news to learn all about what we're shipping. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. See folks. you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox. Thank you.